Hello, and welcome to my presentation on the UK PDS and the DCCT. Uh, both were major landmark trials in its day, and they were really important in answering questions on if lecture control would really help patients with diabetes. And so both are important trials. They may show up on the exam. And so what I would know from these trials is, you know, the, whether they studied people with type 1 or type 2 diabetes, what the results were. If there are questions that show up on the exam, there probably will only be like one or two questions. So I wouldn't uh, you know, go back and read the trial and memorize the patient populations, but I would just have a general idea of what these studies uh, showed and uh, you know, what, the, what the results were basically. So I'll start with the UK PDS. That stands for the United Kingdom Prospective Diabetes Study. And so it was a landmark study because back in the 1960s, healthcare professionals weren't sure if lowering blood glucose would actually help with microvascular and macrovascular events. A study had just been, shown, had been, just been published using tolbutamide, fenformin, and insulin that had to be ended early because it actually showed increased harm. So this was confusing and left us healthcare professionals kind of scratching our heads, wondering, you know, was treatment beneficial? And if, if it was beneficial, what kind of target should we be aiming for? And so the UK PDS was designed to help answer those questions. And so uh, its primary aim was to see if improved blood glucose control would help prevent complications in people with type 2 diabetes. So uh, the, the UK PDS only looked at people with type 2 diabetes, while the DCCT looked at people with type 1 diabetes. And as you can see, they had very limited options back then. They only had sulfonylureas, insulin, and metformin. And so here was the patient characteristics. It was a very fairly large study for its time, uh, enlisting over 5,000 patients newly diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Uh, you know, they, their A1C on average was 9.1, and their fasting sugar was uh, high at 11.5. And so uh, these patients were split into two arms the conventional arm and the intensive arm. So with the conventional arm, initially they were just treated with diet alone, and they were aiming for a near normal weight, a best fasting glucose of less than 15, and for them to be asympt asymptomatic. Now, I know nowadays that aiming for a blood sugar of less than 15 is absurd, but back then they weren't completely sure what, aiming, what target to be aiming for. And so if they did develop market hyperglycemia, they would be allocated to a, a non-intensive, non-aggressive uh, pharmacological therapy. Now contrast that with the intensive arm. Uh, they aim for fasting blood glucose of less than six, and to be asymptomatic, they were treated with sulfonylureas or insulin. And uh, when, if they develop market hyperglycemia, they would be transferred to a more aggressive regimen using more complex insulin uh, regimens like uh, multiple daily injections. And so here was the result of that. As you can see, the intensive arm had an improvement in their A1C. You know, they were trying to aim for a uh, A1C of around six in the intensive arm, but they never really reached, reached that. Uh, but as you can see, uh, they had a, a better A1C than the conventional arm. It did creep up slowly over time, but at all times, the intensive arm did maintain about a 1 to 1.5% 1 uh, less A1C than the conventional arm. However, that did come at a cost. Uh, the hypoglycemia, which, hypoglycemia was much more prevalent in the intensive arm. That's the blue line up there. And at all times, they had more hypoglycemia and major episodes of hypoglycemia than the conventional arm, which is the white line down below. The UKPDS also looked at this parameter called the any diabetes-related endpoint. And so they looked at 
how long it took from to the first occurrence to any of these following uh, diabetes related complications. And in the endpoints, in, at the end of the study, they saw that there was a significant reduction in the intensive arm for any diabetes related endpoint, and it was statistically significant. So uh, if you look at the p-value, a p-value of 0.05 or less means that it was statistically significant, that it was probably not due to chance that the intensive arm probably did have a uh, reduction, not, not due to chance. The ones in yellow are statistically significant. So you can see that there was a reduction in any diabetes-related endpoint, but there was not, uh, it did not reach statistical significance for diabetes-related deaths and all-cause mortality. Though it did favor intensive therapy, it did not, it was not statistically significant. So you, they couldn't say, okay, was this due to chance or was this just due to treatment? Um, looking at myocardial infarction, actually, it just barely miss, missed statistical significance. The p-value was 0 0.052. If it was, would have been under 0 0.05, then they would have said that, okay, intensive therapy does favor a reduction in, uh, there is a uh, statistically significant reduction in uh, myocardial infarction, but because it didn't reach significance, you know, they, couldn't, they could say that it favors it, but it could have still been due to luck. Oddly enough, stroke actually favored conventional treatment, the less intensive therapy treatment, whereas microvascular complications very much favored intensive treatment. The p-value was 0 0.0099, meaning there was very, very, very unlikely due to chance that this was just due to chance. There was very, very likely that intensive treatment led to a reduction in microvascular endpoints. So let's switch gears a little bit and look at the DCCT trial, Diabetes Control and Complications trial. So uh, the UK PDS looked at people with type 2 diabetes, but the DCCT and the EDIC trial looked at people with type 1 diabetes. And so pre-1920s, if someone was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, it was basically a death sentence, unfortunately. Uh, you know, people with type 1 diabetes would, would just die after five to 10 years. There was no cure. And as I discussed in my pathophysiology lectures, without insulin, glucose can't enter the cells, and then the person just slowly wastes away and dies. So after Banty and Best developed insulin, uh, type 1 diabetes was no longer a death sentence. Great, yay! Um, but however, healthcare professionals noticed that people with diabetes develop uh, complications with their eyes, with their nerves, with their kidneys, leading to retinopathy, uh, neuropathy, uh, ki kidney disease. And at that time, there was a debate on, you know, what was this caused by? Was this a normal course for diabetes? Was it maybe a side effect from the manufactured insulin that we were giving people? Or was it due to high sugars? Now, of course, I know that sounds absurd today, but back then they didn't have the benefit of these major trials. And so the DCCT was designed to figure out if lowering blood glucose would help reduce these complications. And so uh, it looked at both primary, primary prevention to see if people who don't have these diseases, uh, lowering sugar would prevent them from happening. And secondary prevention, in people who already have these diseases, would lowering sugar prevent the pro progression? Here was the study cohorts. Uh, they had a primary prevention arm and a secondary inter prevention arm uh, with different uh, years of duration of, duration of diabetes. Uh, in the primary, there was no rec retinopathy or microalbuminuria. In the secondary, dairy, secondary pr uh, prevention, uh, people had one or more microaneurysms. They didn't have severe non-proliferative -prolif diabetic retinopathy, but they might have had uh, you know, moderate or, or minor. And they all had less than 200 milligrams of albumin excretion. But they could have had less than that. And so these, these arms were split into two, two treatment arms. 
one, the conventional treatment, which is just one or two insulin injections per day, or the intensive treatment arm, which was three or more injections of insulin per day and insulin pump. Now again, I know it sounds absurd nowadays to treat a type one, a person with type one diabetes, with just one single injection, uh, fair injection insulin a day, but again, back then they didn't know what exactly was effective. And so you can see for the intensive regimen, they aim for three or more injections, four or more self-monitoring of blood glucose, they had pre and post meal targets, and a target A1C of six. They didn't reach it, unfortunately, but as you can see, they reached an average of about seven. But as you can see, they, the intensive arm did manage to achieve an A1C about two less than the conventional therapy arm. And at the end of the trial, when they looked at the results, for in the eyes, they saw a significant uh, decrease in the development of retinopathy. They saw a uh, decrease in the three step progression of retinopathy and less severe non proliferative diabetic retinopathy. For the kidneys, they saw less microalbuminuria and less albuminuria. And in the, in the case of the nerves, they saw less clinical neuropathy. So, in summary, for the DCCT, uh, they had achieved a substantially lower A1C and it was consistent in major microvascular benefits. So, after the DCCT finish, came, then they started with the EDIC trial, the Epidemiology of Diabetes Interventions and Complications. So, this was the, like the follow up study. And its major objective was, again, to look at microvascular disease, but also look at cardiovascular disease as well. And so here was the, here was the results. Uh, after the DCCT trial, the people in the intensive arm, they were discharged and uh, left, to, uh, you know, left to their own devices, and their A1C slowly crept up to about an average of 7.9, whereas the conventional therapy, they were discharged, but they worked harder to get their A1C down, and they eventually came to an A1C average of about 8. So basically, the conventional and the intensive arm basically kind of came together until their A1C results were very similar 10 years after, you know, uh, throughout the time of the EDA trial, you know, they got closer and closer. And for a while, it's indistinguishable. The 8.0 and 7.9 is very similar for A1C. But what they found was that even though their A1C was similar, the people in the intensive arm still had a benefit in microvascular uh, a benefit in the reduction of microvascular disease. And so they kind of dubbed this the legacy effect that, uh, and it seems to persist for at least 10 years afterwards, this benefit. And so even though the people in the intensive arm, their A1C was very similar to people in the conventional arm, they still enjoyed reductions in uh, retinopathy, reductions in nephropathy, reductions in neuropathy. And now let's look at the cardiovascular evidence. So they, they did find a benefit in cardiovascular disease. It didn't show up right away. As you can see in the graph, it took a, a while for that conventional arm and that intensive arm for their, uh, their lines to separate. But at the end, they did find that there, it was statistically significant. The p-value was 0.018. So it was significant for non-fatal MI, stroke, or cardiovascular death. And so uh, these were the, so in conclusion, they found that, uh, you know, treating early uh, had benefits later on, even if their A1C increased. Uh, they found benefits in uh, macrovascular disease and microvascular disease. So uh, yeah, that's it for my presentation today. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Uh, please look at my website, uh, www.cde study course for more uh, practice quizzes and exams. Thank you very much for your attention.